Hello and welcome to our first episode of You, Me, and Ennui. I'm joined by our guest this week, Pete Davis. And for those who don't know him, Pete Davis is a writer and civic advocate from Falls Church, Virginia. He is an author of Dedicated, A Case for Commitment in the Age of Infinite Browsing and the co-producer of Join or Die, a film about why you should join a club. Welcome, Pete. It's great to have you. So glad to be here. So this season, we're really diving into the idea of relationships. And we thought that what better way to start a season about relationships than talking about commitment, because relationships require commitment, right? Totally. In in many ways, you know, I feel like I, you know, I wrote this whole book and gave the speech on commitment, but really it's about relationships because, you know, sometimes people have reached out to me and they've said, oh, is this about commitment to gym routines or commitment to a diet plan? And I said, no, 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 it's not about that at all. It's not just about willpower. It's about how do we enter into relationships with things outside of ourselves? Great. I love that. Yeah. People think of commitment and they think gym time. Um, so <laughs> it's interesting. Um, when did you first become interested in the theme of commitment? You know, I have always been interested in kind of these grand social questions. Um, and so I was just kind of reflecting throughout my 20s on, you know, what's going on in our society and why are people so unhappy about it? And, um, you know, what, what the heck happened, <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, there's the sense of many people my age, I'm a right smack in the middle of the millennial generation, um, that we're living in dark times, you know, that community is in decline, that there's major political problems that are not being solved, that all of our institutions are corrupted, that some hopes that we might have had 10 years ago about how to solve these problems have been dashed, you know, the apps are not going to save us, the shiny politician is not going to save us. And everyone's looking around and saying, what happened and what do we do? Um, and I had always been reflecting on that question. Um, and that's a big political question, but it's also a personal question of, you know, what do we do literally as people in our, in our society? Um, and I kept returning to that the people that were giving me the most hope and the people that also seemed to feel the most joy were the ones that who I eventually came to call long haul heroes, people who worked on things for a long time, people who ignored the creed of our time that we had been told by every adult in our life as we were growing up, which is keep your options open. They were the ones who ignored that advice. They were the ones who for foregoed options and made commitments to love a particular thing over the long haul. And um, I started kind of following that trend of, you know, who are these people that are uh, committed to causes or crafts or communities or places or just people over 5, 10, 15 years, they were the people that were making progress on things, bridging divides, restoring institutions, uh, giving us hope. And they were the people that, you know, were smiling at the end of the day. And and that's why I wanted to look into uh, answering the question of all have what they're having, which is commitment. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, I love the term long haul hero. Who's your who's your favorite long haul hero? Oh my gosh, you know there's a whole range, uh, and you know I've I've happened to run into a bunch in my life that have been my personal heroes. But you know the the group that I'm most taken by are the abolitionists. Um, I, I'm really into American history, and I think you know despite the fact we all learn about them, I don't think we appreciate the like almost biblical level of. Uh, vi victory they won for humanity. You know, my um, my dad went to this college called Antioch uh, College in Ohio, and their slogan was from their founder, Horace Mann, which was, be ashamed to die until you have won a victory for humanity. And talk about a victory for humanity with the abolitionists. They were, you know, I, I really like looking up to them as long-haul heroes because they so illustrate this point of you know, they took this almost intractable problem. They proved it wasn't intractable. Um, you know, they, they were able to win a great victory for humanity. And it shows that, you know, things aren't going to change. You're being too naive if you think things are going to change in one year. But you're being way too cynical if you think things aren't going to change, aren't going to change in 10 or 20 years. So they're the ones I look up to most. They're a grand example, but everyone who's a parent, everyone who keeps a marriage going, everyone who mentors a kid and is a teacher to a kid or is, you know, care, cares, stays, sticks in the town and cares for it. They're also my, my long haul heroes as well. And you've touched on, you know, the generational difference. Um, you've also gone through 
the history of, of commitment making, but what do you feel or what do you perceive is the generational difference in commitment making? You said that, you know, the advice that we've been given is keep your options open. Um, do you feel like that's the biggest hurdle that's really challenging younger generations from committing to things? Yeah, you know, there's always, I don't want to be kind of a finger wagging. Uh, I don't want to be like that young person that has like the super old and grumpy heart and kind of finger <laughs> wags as this fellow appears. That is not what I'm trying to say with this. And, you know, across a life cycle throughout all time, you know, you can find in old books from the 1600s, people talking in their 20s about wanting to infinitely browse, which is kind of like the antagonism of the antagonist of my my book is infinite browsing mode um, as opposed to committing. And there's always been people in our life cycle. There are times where we want to browse and escape the commitments that we're in and go explore and be adventurous. That's the like romantic capital R spirit. Um, but I do. But, you know, I, I say in the book, there are there are times where that kind of romantic hitting the road eventually curdles into a feeling of ennui, a feeling of disconnection, a feeling of shallowness, a feeling of um, choice paralysis that we eventually want to overcome. And now, do we, if it's always been here, why are we talking about it now? Well, I do think there are some generational aspects to this. So one is we have really solid data that says, institutions that attach you to commitments like civic organizations um there's been a decline there's less um organizations in in american life that are pulling you out of yourself and challenging you to live in the public interest you know this is what robert putnam's book bowling alone uh is about is about the decline of these types of congregations unions civic organizations that pull you um out of yourself and attach you to something there's also been a a bit of a change in our educational culture where we have this hyper meritocracy that is basically the church of keeping your options open where you know most of our prestigious institutions are telling their students um this education is not for attaching you to the public spirit it's for you to get your tool bag for your own advancement um and uh, your job is to use this to advance yourself, and that's what public spiritedness is, just you advancing, as opposed to you attaching to something larger than yourself and working in service of it. Um, and, you know, there has been a rise of that culture um, and a decline in kind of the public spirited culture. So, plus, we have this technology that is kind of the omega point of what the growing technology of the last hundred years has been of radio and movies and cars and airplanes that says you know, you can go anywhere, see anything, in Mark Zuckerberg's word, have have a thousand times as many experiences. He literally wrote that as one of his goals for Facebook as you could a hundred years ago. Um, and that's making it hard to kind of lock into one. Yeah, I'm tired just thinking about that. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, great. I mean, I what you what, what you just said really resonated with me, this idea of like keeping your options open, especially in like the academic field. Um, you know, if I can speak personally for a second, I was a communications major and I always joked that it was the best way to stay undeclared for four years and then figure out what you want to do after. So, um, you know, I'm just curious, you know, it's, it's really easy to um, become susceptible to this in infinite browsing. Um, but what do you recommend for anyone who's feeling that way? How do they break through that or break away from that or even yeah, the baby steps <laughs> you know and, and i think the answer is baby steps you know we have these fears it's like when you stand outside the threshold that you need across to enter into a relationship with anything with a person with a place with a profession with a craft with a community with a cause um there's this feeling that you're on like you, you're on one side of a threshold you look inward and as the closer you get to making the the jump, you feel all this resistance. You know, um, even like when you're about to become friends with someone or about to um, join a club or about to lock into join a congregation, you know, you look at it and you're like, do I really want to be part of that? Is this the right thing for me? Is this exactly me? Will I wake up 10 years later and be like, why did I choose that instead of something else? Um, is this a threat to my identity? Is this changing my reputation? Oh gosh, if I commit to doing that, um, you know, think of all the things that um, I can't do if I do that. You know, if I'm obligated every Thursday at 7 p.m. for this book club, that's going to really lock in all my Thursdays. And what if there's an opportunity on a Thursday and they're all relying on me to come to the book club? You know, all that resistance hits you. 
Um, and the metaphor I used is infinite browsing mode is a, you know, a screen, a browsing screen of picking a movie, you know, when you're on Netflix late at night trying to choose what you want to watch um, at night. And we feel that with a movie too. It's like, oh, do I really want to watch that? Oh, do I really want to do this for the next two hours? Do I got to get locked in? But what's the experience on the other end of the movie um, when you finally choose it and you get 10 minutes in? That fear of regret and that fear of missing out starts falling away because you start getting attached to the characters. You start getting charmed by the setting. You start getting intrigued by the mystery of the movie. And 15 minutes in, you're like, I, I can't do anything else because I got to watch this. It pulls you in because you decided to click in and get to the other side of the threshold. It is the same with much more important things than movies. The second you join something, you start building relationships. You start learning about the epic story of that thing that you joined. You start having a thing that psychologists call the psychological immune system go to work, which is our um, this thing inside of our psyche that makes us um, justify what we've decided to do it's why you know it's why when you don't get a job and you accept that you don't get a job your brain starts working and saying well it was for the best that you didn't get that job or if you decided to choose something among two hard choices it starts saying well you made the good choice because of this but that only happens if you cross the threshold so my my big advice to people is i don't have anything profound to say or any clever tricks all you have to do is jump it's like standing on the side of a rope swing at the top of a ledge to go into the fun water. You know, um, uh, my whole goal with the speech and with the book was to just give a giant nudge because th in some ways that's a hard answer that I don't have the, you know, any tips or tricks. But the hopeful thing is that once you get to the other side of the threshold, all of the forces of resistance start flipping and pulling you inward towards the thing and know that it's not a struggle every single day it's once you get to the other side, you're on a conveyor belt of the thing opening itself up to you, your psychological immune system kicking in, you building relationships, you developing comfort with the people that are there, you not having a sense of regret of what you didn't choose, but regretting being unable to imagine having not chose it, you having a fear, going from having a fear of missing out of all the things you can't do because you have book club on Thursday at 7 p.m. to you saying, I'm scared of missing out on our one year anniversary of the book club or the big annual thing that we do every week because that you start rewiring your sense of meaning by making your commitments. It becomes who you are. I know that was a long rant, but I really wanted to justify, you know, the fact that it's just, you know, jump. <laughs> do it <laughs> no I, I love it and you know it does bring a, a sense of comfort to know that all you have to do is take that first step and hopefully if everything aligns like you you do have the momentum you need to keep going yes i, I love that so not a rant thank you um <laughs> so you mentioned your convention speech which was in 2018 you published dedicated in 2021 what have you continued to learn about commitment since then and how have other people opened your ideas to open your eyes sorry to ideas that maybe you hadn't considered or are there any new arguments yeah. for commitment? You know, I, yeah, I, I, it's so funny when you write a book or you make a movie or give a speech or something, you spend all this time working on it, thinking you've thought everything possible about it. But then the real act of publishing something is you get to have all these conversations with people about how they're moved by it or what it makes them think or what pushback they have or what examples they have. And you get to the end of that journey of a book tour or something and you're like, oh gosh, I wish I could write a second edition now because half of my thoughts on this have happened after I've published it. Um, and so that's a great question. Um, you know, my biggest thing that I've taken away is that I did not fully figure out that when I'm talking about commitment and when I'm talking about long haul heroism, what I'm really talking about, as I said at the top of this pot, this uh, interview, uh, this conversation is relationships. It's really a question when I say the difference between infinite browsing and being in a commitment is actually the difference between not being in a relationship with the world and being in a relationship with the world. And I think that's even like a deeper understanding of what's going on here than commitment versus browsing and really this could have been a whole argument of not make a commitment and it and it's really an argument of enter into relationship with the world and particular things in the world um and it reminds me of I, it was right in front of my eyes but i didn't um i didn't discover it before i published the book which was my favorite book of all time and the one i'm most moved by and the one that kind of shapes my life is this book called i and thou by martin buber 
Um, he's a Jewish theologian from the early 20th century, and he said there's two ways of relating to the world. I and it versus I and thou. And he meant like I as in me and thou as in you or it as in you, what, what, how you're relating to the things that present themselves in front of you. And he said when you relate to the world as I and it, you say I to the it in front of you, you see everything and everyone as objects that have purposes in the life that you already have. You're like, I have this conception of who I am and what I need and what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to get and how, what I'm trying to achieve and how I'm trying to advance. And everything around me is an object in service of that. Um, or, you know, you think about the person in front of you or the cause in front of you or the city in front of you or the, the craft in front of you and you say, um, how can I use this? How does this bother me? How does this serve me? How is it different than this? How does it measure up against everything else? Is it bigger or smaller? Is it better or worse? How is it as a tool? Um, how can it facilitate things for me? When you see the world as I and thou, I and you, when you say you to someone instead of it, you see other things as subjects. You see them as fellow eyes that are having their own mysterious experience. They're full of life. They're also living a real life. They're not, you know, non-player characters in the video game of life. They're fellow players. <laughs> um, and most importantly, when you enter into a relationship with them, they're able to transform you it's a give and take dance of you move them, they move you, and you create co-create things together. It is not just you using them. And so many things in our world push us to see each other as objects. And the push for commitment, that's what browsing mode is. How will this movie serve me? How will this cause, is this cause really fitting me? Is this person really my type of person? What relationship is, is, I'm entering into a mysterious transformative thing with this thing in front of me. Um, and I'm going to stick with it to see where it takes us. Um, you know, that's, that sounds like a great second addition to your book, perhaps. Um, <laughs> but I know you've been working on other projects as well. Uh, you have the film Join or Die that just came out, uh, Why You Should Join a Club. Can you say more about the, the film? Yeah, you know, in some ways it's a spiritual sequel of sorts to, um, to the book because it's about a specific type of commitment, which is commitment to a civic organization, whether, and we use club in the broadest sense of the term. It can mean a union, it can mean a con religious congregation, it can mean being part of the public life of your town, and it could mean standard clubs like the Rotary or the Qantas or whatever, you know, basketball league, softball league, bowling league, you know, whatever this is. Um, I, make it, I make it with my sister. We've been working on it for five years. She's from documentary world. I'm from like civic and community thought world and we came together to make a documentary about uh american civic life and um and community life and the history of gathering um the reason we made it is basically um you know every that we're in a social isolation crisis today um it manifests in personal lives as loneliness it manifests in public life as a lack of civic organizations that are the building blocks of democracy. Um, and if you start looking at personal problems of why are we all so lonely and public problems of why is our democracy not functioning, they both kind of trace back to the lack of this, you know, mediating institutions of these civic organizations, congregations, unions, and the like. Mm -hmm. And there's this professor that, you know, that sounds like a nostalgic, kind of abstract thought, but there's this professor, Robert Putnam, who's kind of a Harvard political scientist who has spent his whole life studying this. And he's found the data that not only shows that, you know, these, these civic organizations are connected to the functioning of institutions, society, and government. He's also shown in his famous book, Bowling Alone, that we've seen a huge decline over the last half century of these organizations and he's kind of one of the leading agitators for how can we rejuvenate community in america so it's a movie that tells the story of that theme through his work um and challenges us to uh turn it around by joining a club i love that i mean it's it's not new to me i've heard from um older generations in my congregation saying oh you know like people aren't joining congregations anymore um but it's almost interesting to hear that this is you know stretches far further out than just uh, my local parish in in new jersey so that's really uh that's really interesting what do you think or what have you seen the response to the movie has been what have you heard well it's you know it's been really um it's been really wonderful because we've had a response that 
is what we hoped the mission of the film would be. So we wanted this on a personal level. We wanted to serve two roles. One is we wanted to get people who are saying, I'm not really a joiner, to be nudged in the direction of joining. And we've had people come up to us and say, you know, I'm going to go join. I, I saw your movie and I went and joined the Rotary Club or I went and joined, um, you know, someone's been always bothering me to join a book club or join the softball league. And I'm going to finally do it because I now see it not as one random thing in my life, but as a very significant part of a life. Um, we've also on a personal level um, wanted to encourage the people who are joiners. And so we we've been really excited by people coming up to us and saying, you know, I am working away year after year, day in, day out, week in, week out, real long haul heroes here, keeping something afloat, keeping my congregation afloat, keeping my union afloat, keeping, you know, my public work and my community afloat. And sometimes I want to give up and your movie helped remind us that, you know, I'm the build you're the building block of of democracy. You can't give up. You gotta do this. And that's given me a new, a new uh you know, fire. And th that's really happy when I hear that. And then on a public level, instead of just this kind of very simple story of join and support those who are helping people join, we wanted to give people a lens of seeing public problems, not just as economic problems and not just as political problems, but also as community and social network problems. And so people are walking away and saying, you know, I'm going to look at the news or look at, you know, trying to answer the question of how do we fix this institution or how do we uh, do, you know, accomplish any public goal or solve any public problem. I got to bring the social network lens to that work to say, maybe the answer isn't, you know, maybe it is, we need more money. Maybe it is, we need to solve the political design of the constitution or this, that, or the other. I, I think we definitely need that, but also it's a story of how do we bridge people across divides? How do we, get people who are isolated to not be isolated anymore? How do we, you know, how do we, uh, how is the social network affecting our challenge here? Well, it's so interesting. I mean, you just said social network. What role do you think, um, I, I hate to say like the pandemic of it all, but you know, there was a time where we were fully virtual, you know, attending meetings virtually, working remotely. Um, some people were live streaming their congregation services virtually. Um, and there were good and valid reasons to do it. And there are benefits for folks who maybe can't physically attend things. So w where do you see the balance maybe between um, like a virtual experience and maybe not this a thousand experiences more than in a lifetime, but is there like a happy medium? Yes. Um, yeah. You know, there's, uh two ways i think about this one is um community is community serves many things and one of robert putnam the main subject of the documentary's findings is to talk about you know the micro aspects of what having a you know thick trusting community does and you know we can start listing off the things community does one is it gives you information one is it helps you um, celebrate it. One is it keeps you in check. One is it helps you find jobs. One is it brings you soup when you're sick. One is it um, helps build a sense of shared meaning in a place. One is it helps create more watchdogs over institutions. One is it spreads ideas. You know, all these different things community does. The internet communities that are created and supported do some of those things. You know, they can entertain you. They can help spread information. Um, but they don't do all of those things. You know, um, when you only have internet connections, you there are so many aspects of community that are only can be done in person. There are only some aspects of the not, and it's not just like hugging each other. It's also that the vulnerability of being in person and not being able to kind of just turn your monitor off or go on mute is the thing that brings people closer together and serves each other. Um, um, the The feedback mechanisms that enliven you you know, you don't have, most people don't have like lovely community fatigue, but they have Zoom fatigue, you know, um, and, and um, <laughs> I think that's part of like the joys of in-person community. So the answer is, so what do we do with that fact that it's not everything? The answer is, you know, don't be a Luddite, use the <laughs> internet and these, these, these technological things to help bolster community, to keep community alive when it has to, when you need to keep some aspects of it. Use it to find out about in-person community. Like it's really good. We have online email blasts that allow us to keep in touch. Bob has found in his research um, 
that alloys, he calls them alloys, communities that are both virtual and in person actually do better than communities that don't have a virtual aspect. So when you get together as a book club, but you also have a text thread where you're texting each other about a thought you had hours after the book club ended, that is making you become closer together and have more things to talk about. And maybe you use the text thread to say, hey, I know book club's not for another two weeks, but I'm having this other event. Why don't you come to it? We're really glad there's a text thread for that. Um, and so the answer is, you know, know that the internet is not enough, but also know that it sometimes helps. So um, those are the, I think we got to find that balance. I hear you. So um, just playing devil's advocate for just a moment, we talked about, um, you know, you talked about this feeling of stepping into a commitment and that um, you'll kind of know when it's working. Are there ways that you can know if a commitment that you've made is not working? And is there like a, a threshold of like, oh, give it a month or two? Um, and if so, you know, how do you back gracefully back out of a commitment if maybe it's yes totally um <laughs> this is a great point i and i don't think that's devil's advocate at all i think that's just a wonderful part of the story of commitment um you know i said um people used to some people came up you know uh, every time i'm saying oh people came up and misunderstood the thing that's my fault because i should have said this better but um you know one of the other ways people misunderstood what i was saying is they're like oh this is a book about not quitting um, and I actually, you know, I say, no, it's a book about not infinitely browsing. It's about the opening jump into a commitment that I'm trying to fight against. You know, we feel a resistance to initially joining something or entering into a relationship with something. And this book and the speech are trying to nudge you across that threshold to join things. It's not telling you on year 10 when you hate it, quit. And in fact, the fear of not being able to quit is preventing people from crossing the threshold because they think oh my gosh, if I join this and I never can quit, I should never join anything. And so actually, I have a whole section in the book called In Praise of Quitting, because if you know that you can quit, it lowers the stakes and allows you to take those baby steps. So now, how do we know when we should quit? Well, you know, the thing I, one thing I, I said in the book, and I really believe is that relationships are like living things, and living things have, you know, uh, a cycle to them. You know, they have the initial moment where they're sparked, they grow and they flourish and eventually living things die. And, um, and relationships also have cycles to them. And if they're a living thing that have give and take and that serve each other and are, are, are fostered by people giving their life to them, you don't want to, if they're kind of more organic than mechanical, you don't want to, uh, I, I don't mean to be like totally macabre here, but mm -hmm. when you are just continuing with something because of a rigid rule of commitment, instead of as like a life-giving relationship between you and the thing and with the relationship itself, um, when you are just play acting because of the commitment, it's like play acting with a corpse. <laughs> you know, it's very creepy. It, and that's yeah. how people feel sometimes when they're going through the motions on something they don't feel anymore. And so when the thing is not giving you life anymore and when you're actually relying too much on just like, I am committed to this and thus I must do this, it's not living anymore and it might be time to end it and free yourself to make other commitments. Um, and so my big way to discern whether, um, discern whether it should be done is, you know, don't quit because of the things that come with every commitment. It's awkward at first. You, you know, when you're first entering into a relationship, you ask how many siblings do you have and how's the weather? And that's <laughs> annoying, you know, you know and, and that's with everything. When you first show up at a group where you don't know anyone, they're all chatting and having all these inside jokes and you don't have that yet. When you're first getting into a cause, you don't feel the magic at first because you're kind of amping up into it and you're not deep enough into it. You're not deep enough into the community to really feel the mythology and this magic of the community yet. Don't quit just because you're starting out. Mm -hmm. um, but if after really giving it a go, um, sticking with it for a while, leaning into a little bit more stickiness and saying, ah, oh, you know, these things take time. If you're still not feeling it, don't, don't play act a commitment just because of a rigid rule. It must be heading in the direction of life. Um, and, and, you know, that's what relationships are like living things. I, I kept this visual. I hope it's not too, uh, 
left of field, but I kept thinking of like a relationship that looks like Weekend at Bernie's. Like you can't just prop up. <laughs> the- yes, exactly. <laughs> that is that is why I even though I'm like, oh, should I be mentioning this macabre thing on on podcast? But I really, it is the metaphor that feels the most like a dead commitment. Yeah. It's like yeah. having a having a you know, a tea party with like a thing that's not alive anymore. It's very yeah. creepy. It's like horrific. And that's what you feel when yeah. you're like, I should be doing this because I'm in this. And the goal, you know, I, I had this, you know, this is a Catholic podcast, right? Of course. Yes. <laughs> you know, and, um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm a practicing Catholic and, you know, there's a big breakthrough I had recently about, um, and, you know, more holy and wise Catholics than me had this mm-hmm. much earlier, but it, it finally reached my soul, you know, when we're called to be good, it's not the goodness eventually when you see holy people, the goodness does not flow from the rules. The rules were kind of like the scaffolding that they grew their true authentic life inside of that eventually directed them in the direction of organically wanting to be good. So when, when Catholicism like calls us to, you know, reach out to, you know, let, let's say talking to a high school student, reach out to the kid who's marginalized at high school, like who's sitting alone in the cafeteria. You know, we feel our Catholic guilt and we feel like, oh, I should go sit with the person who's sitting alone. The deepest holy Catholic holiness is not sit with that person and even though you don't like them and even though they're, they're, they're bad and, you know, you don't like them, do it anyway because that's the rule. That's yeah. not what we're called to do. What we're called to do is sit with them, encounter them, and open up your heart to see the goodness in them and eventually get a kick out of them and let the magic of you know in our in our religious way of saying this the magic of god connect you (laughs) and eventually you want to sit with them because um that's what we're called to do and in some ways that's what commitment is it's like encounter the world and enter into a relationship and let it naturally take its course not do it because that's what a good person is. I don't know. Does that resonate at all with your personal experience with this too? Totally does. I'm smiling because it makes me think of, um, there's a member of my parish community, Chris, and he is, in the beginning, he was very shy and just a bit awkward, but not quite sure how to approach people. And I have to give credit to my boyfriend. He made a lot of effort to spend time with him week after week. They would watch football together. And I've, in the last six months, I've really seen him really grow as a member of the community. He's now going to start a run club outside of our parish. Love it. And he loves chatting with other people. And he came to our fish fry on April 1st and he played this really funny April fool's joke on everybody saying, Hey, you know, I'm moving to Pennsylvania next week. And we're all like, Chris, what do you mean? Like you just got a new job. What's going on? And he just goes, April fools. You should have seen your faces. And he pulled it on every single person <laughs> and he changed the state that he was moving to it was really funny to see but also i remember afterwards my boyfriend and i were thinking you know chris is really coming to his own in this community and we're just so happy to have him so i i really was smiling the whole time you were saying that because it made me think of him oh i love that story i love that story yeah. and that's that's what we believe it's that it's that it's not that it's that there's a light inside of everyone and like if you really believe that the goal is to kind of find it not to even though i don't see it this is what i should do because i'm a good person that's right. that's making it about ourselves and um and you know i believe that's how all relationships work well yeah. so we're coming towards the end of our time together and there is a question that we're asking each of our guests because the name of the show is you me and ennui um so we're just curious to know is there anything that's giving you a sense of ennui listlessness or blahs right now and you know how do you break out of it yeah, you know, I, I, um, I feel this all, you know, the, what's funny about writing this whole thing is people are like, well, you must be committed to all these things or you're a hypocrite. And, I, you know, I say at the beginning of the, the book, and I, I'm open in every interview I do about this, is that I struggle as much as everyone else in, um, in this in this stuff and I'm infinitely browsing all the time. I'm literally infinitely browsing at night for movies when that was my central metaphor and I'm doing it in life with things all the time. And I, um, yeah. And, and, you know, I, I just go back and forth all the time. Sometimes I feel really alive and other times I, you know, you look out of the world and it's, it is really dark sometimes, you know, it, you feel like, you know, um, 
the way the economy structured is making everyone just like a salesman to each other. You feel like, oh my gosh, we're going backwards and solving political problems. You feel all these kind of, and you feel sometimes you're in the background of like a disaster movie because like the TV in the background is like, AI super intelligence is going to destroy everything or climate change is going to destroy everything or, you know, uh, uh, nuclear war is back on. And it's like, oh my gosh, we're in the first scene of, you know, this isn't ending well. And, you know, I'm raising, a, I, my kid just turned one, my first kid. And it's like, what am I raising him into? And um, I really, you know, the way, and so that I sometimes kind of hit the darkness and kind of have literally like hello darkness my good friend plays in my head you know the Simon and Garfunkel song yeah. and I I sound like I'm just hitting my talking points on this but I wrote it because I really believe it I just think of the people who chose to, that that passivity is what creates the cynicism and what creates the hopelessness all the people that decide I'm gonna dive into the world more and I'm gonna lean more into having a relationship with the world, suddenly become more hopeful. And, you know, I, thinking about those people, thinking about Dorothy Day and what she chose to do, thinking about my favorite Jesuit priest, James F. Keenan, who's fighting the good fight uh, uh, out of Boston College, thinking about what Fred Rogers did in the waste, vast wasteland of television and said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna create a little corner um, and it's gonna be different. I really, I, I really, it makes me feel that, you know, a tiny alternative is not a small thing. Like if you can make 1% of the world more true, more beautiful and more good, you're not at the bottom of the mountain and you have 99% to go. You're already fully there. And that life is just waiting to spark and resonate and spread. Um, and so creating these little countercultures of different ways of being um, and the people who have done that give me great hope and I get excited by them and then I get excited to emulate them um, in the best that I can. And so that's that's what we can do. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Pete. Uh, before I let you go, uh, where can people find out more about what you're working on, what you're doing? Yeah, I'm at PeteDavis.org and we are currently, the big thing we're pushing right now is my sister and I's documentary, Join or Die, and you can go to joinordie.film. And we are screening all around the country and there's a form on that website for um, filling out if you want a screening in your neck of the woods, the trailer's there and you can kind of see reviews so far to get a sense if it's something you'd like. And um, we'd love, we want to have screenings all across the country. So um, reach out. That's great. Well, I can think of no better metaphor than the beginning of our pod, for the beginning of our podcast than to dive right in, to swing right in. So I hope everyone who's listening at home, you know, decides to dedicate to listening to the rest of the season. Um, so thank you, Pete, for the perfect kickoff to the podcast. Amen. And I'm, I, you know, I'm not just saying this to, to just blow smoke at the end, but creating a podcast and creating a relationship with an audience is a great example of this and yeah. setting out um i really believe that too um setting out to begin your your long haul in this um very excited to see where this goes oh thank you i'm gonna carry that with me thank you Pete. <laughs> <laughs>